Well, this morning, I'm not going to be dealing with a particular text, but instead I want to deal with a theme or a a topic which has been at the forefront in our study in Hebrews. It's come back over and over again in Hebrews, and that theme is heaven. Heaven where the glory presence of God dwells in unapproachable glory light. And not only is heaven where God's glory presence is, but it is likewise the destination of the redeemed, the saints. Hebrews, maybe more than any other book, emphasizes on the heavenly goal of God's people in the new covenant, the heavenly nature of it, or we might say the eschatological focus. The focus in Hebrews is on heaven from the beginning, the realm that belongs by way of promise to the saints of the Lord, the people of God, those who belong to and follow after Christ. The one who is the leader and captain who has already ascended, blazing the trail into that very glory realm itself. Christ who made purification for sins on earth and now having ascended has sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high in this very highest heavens behind the veil which is why it is invisible to us. In Hebrews, we have seen that heaven is the realm of the true realities, while earth is the realm of the copies, the shadows. Or to say it more technically, heaven is archetypal, earth is ectypal. And this becomes very apparent in Hebrews 8, where we are told that the earthly tabernacle is a copy of the true archetypal heavenly reality. And that since heaven becomes the type, and the tabernacle on earth is the antitype, and therefore it is a vertical relationship between heaven and earth, not merely a horizontal one between the old and the new covenants. Heaven is the true tent, according to Hebrews, the true temple, and Christ the true high priest who is there even now after making satisfaction for sins. They are now interceding for us Promising to bring us to where he is in our deaths until he comes again. Meaning this heaven is the promised temple realm to which the saints are being and will be gathered. The temple realm into which my dear friend and teacher was gathered this week carried into glory in the arms of the Good Shepherd. And we see this in Revelation 7, this very temple realm where those who have died in Christ are in the presence of God. Revelation 7, 14, they, those who have died, have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. That's heaven. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The sun will not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to springs of living water. And God God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. That is heaven. But when did this heavenly realm become the focus? Not in the New Testament, but even in the Old Testament. The hope of heaven and the heavenly nature of our religion The heavenly focus is not something that only begins with the coming of Christ, but it is the focus of the saints all throughout the scriptures. 
even back into the Old Testament. We might consider Isaiah and the other prophets who actually saw this glory realm, this dimension. They entered in behind the veil, seeing heaven, the throne of God, the temple of God, filled with his glory presence. Not like the copy on earth, where there were golden cherubim hovering over the throne of God in the Holy of Holies and the copy in the tabernacle. But Isaiah got a glimpse of the true archetypal reality, Isaiah 6. And surely this caused him and the others to desire heaven over and above earth, which was marred by sin and death, creating in them a hope. The hope of heaven, eternally dwelling there, not here, there, Coram Deo, before the face of God. Do you not think that one of the most heartbreaking moments in all of Isaiah's life was to come back to earth after seeing what he saw in heaven? Have you ever thought about that? He sees this vision, all the glory, no sin, no suffering, no death. He gets a taste and a glimpse and then he has to come back down to this sin-stained, death-riddled world. What do you think he longed for until he died? That. The same is true of the psalmists all over the Psalms. Psalm 5, 7, David says, I, through the abundance of your steadfast love, will enter your house. That's where my heart is, your house. I will bow down toward your temple in the fear of you and understand that this is a future hope. He is not here talking about the earthly temple which did not exist yet. That earthly temple was built by his son, Solomon, after David was dead and gone. And therefore, when he talks about entering God's house, his holy temple, he is not talking about some place on earth. He is talking about heaven, the true dwelling temple house of God. This is further confirmed in Psalm 11, the same psalmist, David. Psalm 11, 4, he says, the Lord is in his holy temple. And lest we think he's talking about some earthly place, he gives us a parallel statement and he says the Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes see, his eyelids test the children of man. That parallelism there in the Hebrew teaches us that holy temple is synonymous with heaven. David had his eyes not on some earthly structure, but on heaven itself, where he would be in the direct presence of God. But what about after the temple was built? Did the heavenly, otherworldly focus change? Did all of a sudden the true saints, the Israel within the Israel of God, start focusing on the things of earth and not heaven? Well, even after Solomon built this temple, and as he was dedicating this temple to the Lord with all of the sacrifices and all that they were doing, as he's praying in the midst of this ceremony, he implores the Lord in different situations, saying, 2 Chronicles 6.39, in all of these different situations, Lord, he says, hear from heaven. Your dwelling place. Meaning that even with the earthly temple standing, built by Solomon, a temple made by human hands which could not contain the incomprehensible, infinite, and transcendent God, the focus even then was still otherworldly, heavenly. The focus was still on the archetypal temple, namely heaven, which according to the Lord is his throne. Isaiah 66, 1. 
And yet we can go back even further. Even to the book of Genesis, chapter 28, for example, where Jacob has a dream. And in this dream, there's a ladder upon which he sees angels ascending and descending. A ladder that connects heaven, which is invisible, to earth, which is visible. Genesis 28, 12, and he dreamed and behold, there was a ladder set up on the earth and the top of it reached to heaven. Verse 17, and he was afraid and said, how awesome is this place. This is none other than the house of God, Bet El. And this is the gate of heaven. Meaning that the land on which Jacob is laying, sleeping, this is the land of the union of heaven and earth, a type of the world to come, finding its fulfillment in Revelation 21. And the city where he had this dream is named in verse 19, Bethel, which in Hebrew, Bethel means house of God, signifying that the heavenly dwelling of God with men will one day occur which necessitates a transformed earth, an earth that is conformed to the glory of the invisible heavens. The very reality purchased by and secured by and inaugurated by Christ himself, who is the first fruits of this new creation, this heavenized world. Christ himself, who is the ladder, the one who connects heaven and earth. We know this because of John 1 51. Jesus said to him, truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. He is clearly alluding to Jacob's ladder, Genesis 28. He is the ladder through whom and by whom we enter heaven. And so it's beyond doubt that heaven, the glorious realm where God's glory dwells in a distinct way, it is the focus of Scripture. It is the focus of Scripture from the beginning, not something that becomes the focus later on. Heaven, which is unseen, veiled, is the focus of all the saints in biblical history. And it is this heaven where our promised inheritance is kept, according to 1 Peter 1, 3 through 5. Or as Paul would say, it is there where we have the hope which is laid out for us in heaven, Colossians 1, 5. But now, what I want us to see is that while we've seen that the heavenly focus is clearly there in redemptive history, meaning history after sin comes into existence, which then inaugurates God redeeming and saving a people for himself by grace, after that has happened, it's clear that the focus is on heaven. But what I want us to see next is that this heavenly focus, the realm of heaven, and the focus on that realm did not actually begin after sin, but actually before sin, which means that from the very beginning of creation, from the very beginning of the existence of man, there is already a heavenly trajectory in the heart and mind of God's human beings. Now, to see this, we have to properly understand Genesis 1-1, which I think is very oftentimes not properly understood. Genesis 1-1 says that in the beginning, God, Elohim there, created the heavens and the earth. And what we have to understand is heaven here does not refer to the realm of the sun and the moon and the stars. That's created later on, if you read through Genesis 1. No, heaven here, which is created before earth, 
is the invisible glory dimension where God's glory presence will dwell. Meaning that God creates this invisible realm before he creates the visible realm in which we now dwell as human beings. And this is clearly the way Paul understood Genesis 1.1. And we know that because in Colossians 1.15 and 16, listen to what he says. He that is Christ is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth. Genesis 1.1. Visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. Meaning that when Paul meditates and thinks about Genesis 1-1, he describes and thinks about heaven and earth as things which are visible in reference to earth and all that's created which we can see, and things which are invisible in reference to all the things that lie behind the veil. And this is even clear, more clearly put forth when we understand the structure of his sentence. I don't know if you write in your Bibles, you should. <laughs> but you might write next to verse 16 there, A, B, B prime, A prime. That's a key answer. It's a chiastic literary structure in such a way that the A's are related and the B's are related. These occur all over the Bible, all the time. But here's the point, is that Paul says that God created A, heaven, and then B, earth, and then he moves to B prime, things which are visible, meaning earth and visible are together synonymous. And then back to A prime, things which are invisible. So the point is, and there's plenty of other texts we can look at to see where the highest heavens are mentioned. Nehemiah 9, 6 is one, there's others. But what's happening here is that when God creates all things, he is creating all things which are invisible, which we think of as heaven, which is a realm where God dwells, and then the earth that which is visible, which we can see, and that realm which we live in now. And why is this important? It's important because once we see that heaven here is not the sun, the moon, and the stars, then we automatically will be able to understand better the trajectory of Adam in the garden, which then explains the heavenly focus of redemption. After God creates heaven, so many Christians think that heaven has eternally existed. That's very problematic. That's pantheism. That means that you now have something other than God that has the same properties as God. Only God existed in eternity and nothing outside of God existed. Heaven as a realm is something outside of God, which came into being, which then he indwelt. And when did it come into being? Genesis 1.1. But after he creates that, and after he creates all that's visible, the whole world, he creates man. And at the same time that God creates Adam in knowledge, righteousness, and holiness, Concurrently, meaning at the same time, by a special act of providence, God enters into a covenant with Adam as one who will represent the entire human race, as one who will represent everyone who comes forth from him by ordinary regeneration, which is all humanity. And this is often called the covenant of works. And what is this covenant? Well, when God places Adam as prophet, priest, and king in the garden of God, he gives him a very specific command. This is special revelation. 
pre-redemptive, special revelation. This is the covenantal word of God. And that word is a probationary word in which God tells this creature who is made upright in his image to not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That is the tip of the iceberg of the covenant of works. And what will happen if he eats? He will die. He will die in the absolute sins. He will die physically, spiritually, and eternally. But what if he doesn't eat? What if he, hypothetically, of course, passes this probationary period, he moves through the testing, and he does not disobey God? Well, the answer is he will live. But understand that it will not just be a living as he is presently living. He will not just be... He will not just exist with the present existence that he already has. But he will live in a way that is symbolized in another tree. The tree of life. Which has sacramental fruit that points to a life that Adam did not yet have. This is why understanding Genesis 1-1 matters. It teaches us that Adam is created, he immediately undergoes probation within the covenant of works, and the prospect put before Adam in the garden, before sin, is ultimately heavenly existence. Heavenly life, if he succeeds and passes the probation, not eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, but judging the angel who has fallen. Do you ever wonder why Paul says we will judge angels? Because Adam was supposed to. What is Satan but a fallen angel who comes to earth and he tries to create the same fall from heaven now on earth? And what was the prophet, priest, and king of God's garden supposed to do? Judge angels. And if he would have, if he would have passed this probationary test, not sinning, not transgressing God's covenantal law, then Adam would have no longer worshipped God indirectly on earth as God came and went. But Adam would be moved. He would be directly and intimately now in heaven, in the dwelling place of God, worshiping God directly face to face in his holy heavenly temple. There would be a movement from indirect worship on earth, even up the Mount of Eden, Ezekiel 28. He would move from that greatness to something even greater, entering into heaven itself. A movement from indirect worship to direct worship. Now, if you understand that, you understand the book of Hebrews. Because what did we argue last week about Hebrews? That the very problem that the Hebrews are facing is that they are obsessed with indirect worship on earth in regard to all the types and the symbols when now in Christ Jesus they have access to heaven where direct worship is. See how it's all connected. The point of all of this is that the goal for Adam was not merely earthly existence if he past probation, the test. But he would move from earth to heaven, or at very least from earth to a heavenized earth. Now I could cite numerous places from Voss to argue this, but I'm going to quote a couple of guys you probably aren't as familiar with, just to prove that I'm not crazy. Francis Turretin, he was a reformed scholastic in Geneva. He wrote three volumes, Institutes of Atlantic Theology. He says this, The sanction of the covenant attended the exaction of duty. 
It consisted both in the promise of reward and gain and in the threatening of punishment. But listen to what he says here. The promise was of the highest happiness of eternal life to be passed not on earth, but in heaven. Meaning if he passed probation, if he did not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, if he perfectly obeyed God in a heart, then he would move from earth to heaven. Thomas Boston, a famous Puritan, says the same thing. He says, God promised him, that is Adam, life, the continuance of natural life and the union of soul and body and of spiritual life and the favor of his creator. He promised him also eternal life in heaven to have been entered into when he should have passed the time of his trial upon earth and the Lord should see meet to transport him into the upper paradise. And this was sacramentally confirmed by another tree in the garden called, therefore, the tree of life. Do you see what this means? This means that before there is sin, before there is any corruption in the world, there is already an eschatology. There is already a heavenly prospect, a greater reality before Adam than that which he had in the moment. This is why Voss says that eschatology precedes soteriology. It's not just something that comes into focus after sin. But from Adam's creation, as an image bearer of God, he has an indwelling desire to be in the very presence of God in heaven which God created first. Now, is there exegetical evidence for this? Yes, or I wouldn't be telling you from the pulpit. We see the tree of life in Genesis 2 on earth. But where does the tree of life reappear in the Bible? In heaven. For example, Revelation 22, verses 1 and 2 it says, Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city, also on either side of the river, the tree of life. There it is. With its twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month, the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nation which means the tree of life shows up in Eden, God's garden on earth. But then it reappears in Revelation in the new creation, which is heaven come down, heaven transforming everything. Meaning that the tree of life always exists to point towards the true reality, which was held out to Adam if he passed probation. Meaning that when Adam was being tested and when he looked at the tree of life, he should have, like a sacrament, he should have looked through that tree of life to where it pointed, namely heaven, where the tree of life is in its true ultimate sense. And now... Who is able to eat from this tree? Well, not Adam. Adam sins against God. He falls. He takes all of humanity into sin and death. And then he is kicked out of the garden so that he cannot eat that fruit. But someone can eat that fruit in the Bible. Someone can eat of the tree of life and partake of what it actually symbolizes. The life of that it sacramentally puts forth? And the answer to that is in Revelation 2.7, the Lord Jesus to the church. He says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches, to the one who conquers, to the overcomer, to the victor. The Greek word's Nike. To the one 
who overcomes, I will grant a gift to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Meaning those who eat from this tree are now gifted this fruit, and in eating so, they must be in the paradise of God, which is where? Heaven. Jesus tells the thief on the cross, today you will be with me in paradise. He's not talking about the Garden of Eden, which no longer existed. He's talking about the true paradise, where the tree of life is, heaven itself. And that fruit, that life, that realm, it is for those who overcome the victors in Revelation, and that is the saints who have trusted in none other than Jesus Christ, the second and last Adam, following now the Lamb wherever he goes, even into paradise. Meaning it is those who are in Christ who eat from this tree and thus receive heavenly eternal life in the true paradise of heaven. The very reality to which the tree of life in Eden pointed. But now we're beginning to transition from seeing the hope of heaven before sin, heaven as the life reward for Adam and his seed, because he was the covenant head representing all of us. We're now transitioning to the hope of heaven as the gift and inheritance and hope of those who are now in Christ which means very clearly that the goal, the prospect before Adam was not aborted. God does not believe in abortion. He does not abort the heavenly goal when Adam sins, but instead God promises that he will send another man, another Adam. The second and last Adam, the seed of woman, Genesis 3.15, who we now know to be Jesus Christ, son of God, son of David, son of Abraham, now incarnate forever, and he will be the one who represents a new humanity. Those who are not only born of the flesh, but of the spirit. Born, yes, but born again. And he will be the one who likewise will undergo a probation attesting that he might be made perfect as man, not as God. He must come and he must do what Adam did not do. And he must bear the penalty that has resulted because of what Adam did do. Which means that now this last Adam, the Lord Jesus Christ, must come and he must perfectly obey the law of God unlike the first Adam who sinned, well, he must also overcome the serpent, which he does in the wilderness. Do you wonder why after Jesus is baptized and the heavens open and the Lord says, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Do you wonder why he is immediately ekbalo? He is thrown into the wilderness where Satan is because he must crush the serpent, unlike the first Adam who was crushed by the serpent. And all of this happens climactically whereas the first Adam was defeated by the serpent under a tree. The last Adam conquered that same diabolical devil on a tree, putting him to open shame and destroying death in his wrath-bearing death in order that now this new humanity, those who are born and born again, all who trust in this last Adam, the Son, might be accounted as righteous and forgiven on account of his work, his covenant headship, 
that we as believers, overcomers, saints, might be counted as having perfectly obeyed the law with no threat of wrath ever again. And what is the reward? What is the end? What is the trajectory? The same end offered to Adam in the covenant of works, which was forfeited due to his sin. Yet now secured for a new race in and through another federal head. The one who offered God perfect and exact and entire and perpetual obedience and satisfaction for sin. Jesus Christ. Securing for us eternal life in in the direct presence of God. The very reality, the very directness, the very realm, which was the longing of the saints all throughout the Old Testament, especially David and the Psalms. Christ has secured, he has obtained, he has merited the very thing that was held out to Adam in the garden before sin. A true, intimate directness in the true temple tent of God in heaven, which is the emphasis and drive in Hebrews, as we've been saying which leads to the absolute, na- the obsolete nature of all realities that emphasize indirectness and separation like the earthly tabernacle and even a merely earthly garden. So it should be obvious to us, I hope, that heaven, the hope of heaven, heaven as a, a reality to be obtained, it permeates the Bible, from Genesis onward. And because the triune God did not abandon this reward, this prospect after Adam sinned, breaking the covenant of works, because it's still there and held out, we now, by faith in Christ, the obedient one who merited this reward in the covenant of grace, we now have and can have the same hope that transcends this present world, which is now fading away and marred by sin and death. Which means that we in Christ, by faith, are heirs of another world, which cannot and does not fade away. We belong now in Christ who is already there to this very realm which is imperishable and unfading. It is the air we breathe as Christians. The air of eternity which blows upon us from heaven until our ship finds its port safely at home. This is why all throughout We see and read things like, if then you've been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above. Where Christ is, Colossians 3.1. We are to be heavenly minded, heavenly focused. But beware of thinking that heaven is some immaterial place. No, the ultimate goal of God in regard to the hope of heaven is not and was not a bodiless existence in an immaterial spirit realm. That was not the hope, the prospect put before Adam if he had succeeded. But if he would have passed this probationary test, his entrance into heaven, the upper paradise, would have been with a transformed body, a glorified body, fit for that existence, the very kind of body that Christ now has in this heavenly realm as he reigns there forever. Meaning the ultimate hope for the Christian is a heavenized creation 
wherein all the saints who are bound to the last Adam by faith live forever in the direct presence of God, not in a bodiless existence, but in resurrected, glorified bodies like that of their Savior. Which means that heaven as we know it right now, which contains the spirits of those who have gone before us, while their bodies are in the ground, this heaven is an intermediate state until Christ comes again and raises his people from the dead in glory, reuniting their bodies and their souls forever. This is the very thing that we must focus on, where we might find our hope, And whatever happens to this world, whatever happens to your body in this world, as all these things fade away, perishing day by day because of sin and death, which corrupts and destroys all things, and you know it, and you see it, and you feel it. I know I say it a lot, but every morning when you look in the mirror, you see death. Every new wrinkle is a sign that you are dying. Every pain in your knee is preaching to you that you are getting old and you are fading away and you are dying. Every time you put a pill in your mouth for your heart, Every time you take ibuprofen or Tylenol or you put on makeup trying to cover up wrinkles and spots, all of that is telling you that you are dying. And yet in the midst of that dying and in the midst of Every birthday being a death day. You ever thought about that? I thought about it on Thursday. My birthday. When I woke up. First thing I saw, Dr. T is gone. My birthday was a death day. And it reminded me of the end of all men. So of the last sermons I listened to him preach. And yet in the midst of every death day, and in the midst of all of this fading away and this perishing, we can have an unshakable hope that is unfading and imperishable. One that is anchored in heaven, bound to Jesus Christ, who lives forever. The one who has promised to sustain us and to bring us home to where he is. And therefore, do not let any suffering, no affliction, no pain, no frustration keep you from the hope that is rooted in another world. A reality that is coming. Paul says, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing to the glory that is revealed to us. God will make up for all of your suffering. He will make up for all of your pain. He will make up for every ounce of affliction that you've ever faced. David says that he keeps my tears in a bottle. Every tear that falls down your face, God knows that tear. And he will not forget that tear. You know, my my dear friend and teacher, He was always in pain, always in pain. And he dealt with sickness every single day. He was on a million medicines, heart was messed up, 
diabetes, just, he was a medical disaster. And I would check on him. Every day. I'd text him or message him. I didn't call him all the time, he was too tired to talk. But he always reminded me to not pity him. He would not allow it. And he would tell me that this very pain and sickness that he knew every single day, it was the very thing that helped him loosen his roots in this world. He said, and I quote him, that it breaks our desire, the pain and the affliction and the sickness, it breaks our desire to be here as we age. And it brings to mind those blessings that come from Christ. Which I took him to mean that his sickness helped him focus more and more on his Savior who promised to carry him home, which is why he would not let me pity him. Bless it! Because of its service to me. That's what he was telling me. And therefore be encouraged, dear saints. Everything that happens to us in this world as God's people is serving us. And none of it compares to the greater glory that is coming, that is to be revealed in our death. And at the return of Christ, and therefore press on and endure and put on your armor and sharpen your sword and polish your helmet and your breastplate and tie up your shoes and don your shield of faith and fight every day. Knowing, as Samuel Rutherford has said so beautifully, that when we shall come home and enter to the possession of our brother's fair kingdom. And when our heads shall find the weight of the eternal crown of glory, and when we shall look back to pains and sufferings, then we shall see life and sorrow to be less than one step or stride from a prison to glory. And that our little inch of time suffering is not worthy of our night's welcome home to heaven.